share a few words with you this evening on uh, well, one topic I was asked to speak about was the topic of letting go. It's a very general topic, but I also wanted to uh, just have, say a few words about the uh, what we're doing in the next little while. We're doing the Rains Retreat and so on, and to sort of offer some reflections on the nature of retreat and so on. With the uh, <coughs> Uh, one of the things which is uh, very, I think, very um, important or very central to the nature of the, the monastic lifestyle which we've chosen is the idea of uh, an idea of a holistic uh, and an integrated approach to practice or to spiritual life. And I think I mentioned this a, a couple of weeks ago in in, uh, uh, in the talk here, but the, that uh, often you hear the. Um, uh, uh, people, there's a kind of an idea that, that, that practice is something separate from da- daily life. Yeah, so you hear this phrase daily life, which I, I loathe and abhor, and I'm still waiting for somebody to give me a better term to use instead of daily life because I, I always wonder what other kind of life is there <laughs> apart from daily life. Um, so, daily life and uh, so you know we have this idea that practice is meditation and daily life is something else than meditation. And how do we, we wonder how to integrate them? Well, the problem is separating them in the first place. So life is practice. There's no, no difference for it. But there's just the, in 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 Buddhism that life we live an informed life. That's all. There's no separation between life and practice. But our life is informed. Our life is reflective. So we, we, we're constantly reflecting what is our motives for doing this, what is our, what's, our, um, what's our motivation, what is the experience like, what do we learn from it. And always trying to reflect in this way, trying to gain, this is how wisdom comes. And the same approach comes when we're coming to meditation. And we shouldn't see meditation as being something which is uh, you know, completely different or another kind of sphere than, than daily life. Practice. In a way, meditation is like the, the refinement of what we're already doing in our daily life. God, do I, how do I have to keep saying that? <laughs> uh, um, But it's the same qualities, and this is one of the things the Buddha pointed out. Meditation is not like it's you know it's not like the the intervention or supervention of some kind of different state, something which is outside. Yeah, like meditation. It's not like in meditation you go to a place or something that's different from what you're experiencing in everyday life. It's just you experience it more subtly and more refined. That the same processes are going on. The mind is the same. Yeah? Gradually it changes a little by little bit, but the same kinds of things are happening what we're doing. So meditation is, you should see, is something which flows on from uh, our practice. It's not, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, like a flow and an integration between our practice. And so sometimes you can see that, that uh, there's a, that there's some people who uh, may be a very uh, good at, at sort of the external aspects of practice, that they, they're very compassionate, yeah, very helpful, they do maybe social work, they, or maybe they maybe it's not something you know, um, you know, maybe not overtly doing that, but maybe even just kind within the family. I mean, there's millions of people like that. They're very kind and good people, and just in their family and with their friends, and they're always helpful and so on. And so in that way, they're very kind of spiritually advanced. I think, for example, one person that comes to mind is my stepfather. You know, he's the most lovely, gentle person. He'll always open the door for you when you walk through the, through the door. He's always very polite and a very kind person to be with, yeah? Uh, but but he doesn't have that that sense of reflection and meditation, yeah. So he's not interested and doesn't understand about what the meditative process is about. So other people you meet in meditation circles, you know, maybe go like to go in and meditate and so on. But sometimes they might, might not have very good social skills. Yeah? They're not very good at being with people. And sometimes even uh, Adam Brahm commented on this. Yesterday, in the, the talk at the Australian Sandra Association conference, that uh, 
in his experience and also I, I would agree completely we, we've discussed this many times is that that the sometimes the, um, the monks that we know who are, are very kind of uh, uh, very like to live very reclusive lives that don't want to have anything to do with anybody um, that they are after when you look at how they've gone after many years and often their meditation has not really progressed very well yeah? even though you think well they've been living by themselves practicing for 10 years 20 years but they haven't necessarily progressed very well in their practice whereas the ones who are, are very helpful who love to serve and who work very well in a community and they tend to be the ones whose meditation goes very well when they have the chance to do that and so I think the problem here is that that lack of integration, that when we perceive uh, our daily life practice as being something separate from and in competition to our meditation practice, then our mind is not very integrated. The inner and external aspects of our mind are in conflict. If we see them as something separate, then that's like a degree of, of uh, lack of integration. If we see them as in conflict, yeah. Yeah, if we actually see meditation as conflicting with our daily life practice, then that's a sign that in our own minds there's this conflict between the inner and the outer uh, directions or aspects of our own minds. Yeah? And so that uh, starts to be a bit of a worry. So from a Buddhist point of view, from a Buddhist monastic point of view, uh, uh, we try as much as we can to integrate that. So practice is always integrated within a whole lifestyle and the way that it's presented in the, the Buddhist scriptures is that uh, practice is always presented like first of all importantly is presented and in, integrated in a whole way it involves everything that you do from how you eat how you live where you live what, what do you do during the day what kind of work do you do what kind of chores do you do how do you speak? How do you relate to people? All of these kinds of things. We start out with those things. We, what do we learn? What do we study? Everything about that life. And then, and then meditation happens within that. So meditation is an aspect of a life, how we live our life. I was almost going to say lifestyle then, and I managed to stop myself for some time. <laughs> <laughs> That's one word that's even worse than daily life. <laughs> So meditation is something that happens within that thing. So it's not something that we, you know, we don't, we don't. Uh, so one of the reasons I have, you know, a problem with this idea of kind of daily life is that it's 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 almost like, well, I'm going to keep doing exactly what I've been doing, and then I can do put meditation in there as well, and then I can fix all the problems I have in the rest of my life. Yeah. So that's sometimes how we think. You know, I can go to work and I can get stressed and I can do all the wrong things wreck my mind and then go and do sit meditation and fix it all up again and then I can go and do it all again yeah? and uh, we can even do meditation retreats where you can do it like really intensively and then in like one week you can undo all the damage you've done for the other 50, 51 weeks of the year yeah? so uh, that's sometimes how we think you know, we want to, to divide things up but that way of thinking is that sign that these different aspects are not integrated in our own mind. It's as long as we're thinking in that way. I remember we had one of the uh, students who used to come to the centre I was staying in in Ipoh, and she said that, that um, she kind of looked at me and she said, you know, when we're, when we're talking, what we think is that we, you know, if we can work hard and make money, then we can retire and then go on permanent meditation retreats. And she just kind of looked at me and said, that's not really the right way to think, is it? Said, no, not really. <laughs> that's not really. That's not right. Letting go. First of all, you get ah, and then I'll be able to let go once I've got enough stuff. Yeah. So I have to say that that uh, lady's now become a nun. So presumably she's she's uh, uh, doesn't think that way anymore. I haven't seen her since she became a nun. But she told me that the only reason at that time she said the only reason she wouldn't become a nun is she couldn't stand the idea of her husband seeing her with with a shaven head. <laughs> so, yeah, different letting go of different things is difficult for us. So, in our lives, when we live, are these things separate? Do we see these things as separate? Yeah. Is pra do we see practice as something separate from work? Do we see practice as something separate from family? Do we see 
practice as something separate from entertainment from all of the things we do with our lives. To the degree that we see them as separate and as conflicting, then to that degree we haven't really integrated those things within our own life. So, uh, so within the uh, Buddhist monastic lifestyle, and generally speaking, that we have time for all of these things. There's time for work, there's time for meditation, there's time for study, there's time for talking, and all of these different aspects of things. And we do those things, typically we do them all a little bit each day. And, uh, but even though uh, uh, that's a kind of a general thing, but we still have uh, periods of time where we have more intensive meditation. Okay, so typically we do that during the rains retreat. So just the background to the rains retreat for those of you who are not familiar. Uh, of course, Buddhism when it started out in India, the originally the the monks and nuns used to live a very uh, wandering lifestyle, and this is this kind of this. Um, uh, wanderlust, which is in the in the in the blood of, of monks and nuns, where they just they just want to be free. They want to be on the open road. And there's this kind of idea of just wandering, staying under roots of trees, and uh, which is very inspiring. Uh, so, <coughs> uh, so typically in, in ancient India, that they would do that. They would wander around stay in a bit of forest, go for arms around in the local village, just have a very few possessions and then just wander around to the next... Kind of like backpackers, really, you know. Is this always what you're doing? Spiritual backpackers in those days, you know. These days you wander around India still. Well, not too much different. So, uh, but according to the actual um, account in the... canonical account in the, uh, in the monastic vineyard, it says that when they wandered around during the rainy season that they the monastics would trample on the crops because of course people were growing their rice and so on in the field so when the monks and nuns wandering around the place they would trample on all the rice that was sprouting and the lay people complained about it so the buddha said okay you should stay in one spot so that's the reason we have a rains retreat yeah <laughs> so this is a kind of one of the things with the monastic discipline we call the vinaya is that they have sometimes these very important rules and things which are established for sometimes it seems quite you know quite trivial reasons. So we, we had a, uh, 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 many many examples of that going that, that you can find. There was an interesting one the other day when I was saw Peter Skilling's talk a few weeks ago in, in Sydney Uni, and this is from a, a later text. But I don't know if you've seen the monks' bowls, but we have like a, a round bowl like that with a lid on it. And uh, apparently, uh, when the reason for that apparently is that uh, Mahakasapa, the Buddha's great disciple, Mahakasapa used to wander for arms, and all the devas, all the gods, used to come and put food in his bowl. Right? But he used to want to go and for um, to go to the poorest districts and and receive arms from only from the poorest people, so that they could make merit. Yeah? And he didn't want to get all the rich food that was given to him by the gods who would come down from the sky from the celestial restaurants and put food in him. So he used to wander for arms with his bowl upside down so that the devas couldn't sneakily sneak food into his bowl while he wasn't looking, you see. And uh, so the Buddha said, Kasapa, why do you wander around with your bowl upside down? He said, oh, well, it's because the gods keep wanting to put food in the bowl. <laughs> <laughs> he says, okay, well, look, why don't you, why don't you get a, a lid for it? He said, oh, that's a good idea. So he said, that's the allowance for a bowl lid. Yeah? So that's why we have bowl lids today. <laughs> Stop the devas from putting food in there when we don't want to. So anyway, this is how the monastic vineyard is. So this, that, that reason is not to, not to uh, trample the crops. Obviously, that's not particularly relevant these days. We don't do a lot of crop trampling. I haven't done in my time. Uh, but still, uh, <coughs> but the other thing was, of course, because in ancient India, the, uh, it's very difficult to travel in that period. There's, there's uh, monsoon, everything's muddy, there's, the rivers are in flood. Uh, so it's quite difficult and dangerous to travel, so it became the custom to settle down in one place. And that's really how a lot of monasteries get started. And even up until recent times in Thailand, that's how the monasteries, especially the forest monasteries, would often be started. That the forest monks would wander around from place to place, they would stay somewhere for a few weeks and then move on. And when it came close to the rains retreat, uh, the, the local villagers would in invite the monks to stay in a little patch of forest or something they had nearby and they would build them some simple bamboo huts there 
and then if everything worked out and they enjoyed staying there, then they might stay on after the end of the rains retreat, and gradually the monastery would be built up around that little settlement. So that's often how monasteries evolve, a very kind of organic process. So we had that period of time where we kind of uh, settled down and we've got a, a roof over our head and so on. Luckily enough, in Australia, the rains retreat still corresponds more or less with the rainy season in India, so we followed the same calendar. Uh, in England and, and the northern countries, of course, it's the middle of summer, so they tend to swap it around to have the rainy season in the other, the other half of the year. So uh, during the rains retreat, so it's a period of being settled and still, it's a period when we try to stop as much as we can or reduce any work that's going on in the monastery. We try not to build things. Um, but it's not a period of sort of absolute, sort of intense retreat during that three months rains retreat. So if you've been on, you know, if you've gone to like a, a Goenka retreat or some Mahasi retreat or something like that, where you just sort of sit there for 10 days, just meditate all day, and you think that the rains retreat is three months of that, then you're going to be either disappointed or relieved okay? <laughs> <laughs> in the experience. And it's not what actually you do during the rains retreat is not really governed, okay? So it's except for the fact that you be still and be settled for that three months, okay? So within that time, some people will do more of a study period, some people will do more of a meditation period, or different, different be handled in different ways in different monasteries. So in our monastery at Santi, we, we try to... Um, be peaceful as much as we can, don't do building. I, I, I stop going outside the monastery to give teachings, so for the rest of the year I tend to I come down here every week and I, I tend to travel around a bit giving talks and teachings of various kinds. <coughs> so I um, stop doing that, uh, and uh, except for occasional special events, so I make occasional exceptions. For various special events, if I can't uh, put it off, uh, or things like if someone dies, you know, and come out to do a funeral or something, you can't say, "Could you please wait to the end of the rains retreat for me?" <laughs> you can't do the, the funeral or something like that. Uh, so various kinds of things. Uh, and as well as that, we also can do uh, a period of like intensive retreat within that period and this is something that even the Buddha himself used to do okay so from time to time and there's various records of this within the, the Buddha scriptures that the Buddha would just say to the monks okay I'm going to go off on retreat for two weeks or for one month and I, in that time I don't want anybody to come and see me except for just somebody to bring my food so someone would bring him a bowl of food each day and he would sit uh, in his kuti and he said to the monks if anybody's <coughs> wondering what am I doing? Right? So you think about that. This is like the Buddha going on intensive retreats. Okay. <laughs> what's actually going on there? Yeah. What's, what's the Buddha doing? He's sitting in intensive retreat, meditating all day. Yeah? Must be something pretty out there. Yeah. He said, if anybody asks, then tell them I'm watching my breath go in and out. Yeah. So this is what the Buddha would do on his intensive retreat. Uh, and so again, there's <coughs> there's these um, uh, uh, you know stories that 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 because the only monk who was allowed to see the Buddha would be the would be the one who would bring him his food, yeah. So of course, then there was a lot of competition among the monks to see who could get to bring the Buddha his food, yeah. So <laughs> it becomes a kind of a, a, a great privilege. So and that's how we feel about it as well. So we'll do that period of of uh, uh, a retreat in, in one's kuti or cave or something like that at Santi Monastery. So you go there for two weeks and just stay there and don't really talk to anybody or do anything and somebody will bring out the food for you. And so it's something we're very happy to do for each other. So like helping to serve each other and to give everybody the chance to, to, to experience that kind of practice. And the problem is that of course you get attached. And of course this is what the problem is. Yeah, And uh, we're actually doing it to let go. So you go to retreat to do letting go. We do all our practice to let go, but we end up getting attached to doing a retreat. Yeah? And if something goes wrong in the retreat, we're furious. Yeah? 
and you can get really annoyed. And and typically, you know, you can you can spend certainly if you have a two week retreat, you can certainly spend the first ten or eleven days just in a concentrated manner, blaming everybody, working out exactly why everybody else is to blame for, for you not having any good meditation. Right? <laughs> so that usually takes up maybe 10 or 11 days of the two-week retreat. <laughs> Finally, after you sort that one out, then in the last couple of days, you can maybe actually do some meditation. And so we, this, is, this is something which I've, I've observed a lot. And uh, you know, I started my own practice, like like many others. I started my, my Buddhist practice by doing as a layman, by going along and doing an intensive meditation retreat, and that was my Buddhist experience. Go there, they say meditate, and sit there and meditate, and just do that. And so this is how we we've been programmed, I think, in modern Buddhism, to think that this is what practice is. You know, practice is where you don't do anything, and you have this very privileged space to be able to really just, just do meditation and not anything else. And it, of course it is a great privilege. Yeah? It's not something which uh, everybody can do. Yeah? It's not something which is easy. Uh, so uh, it takes a lot of different kinds of uh, resources and factors and conditions which come into place, I think so. come into place together to be able to, <coughs> for the able to, uh, to support that and to facilitate that. In some traditions, um, charge a lot of money for it. Yeah? So these days, you know, in the Tibetan traditions and other traditions, they'll charge, you know, you can go like on a three-year retreat or something like that, and you know, there's quite substantial fees just, just to cover the cost of the accommodation and the food and all of those kinds of things. So in our tradition, in the forest tradition, everything's done on a donation basis. So everything's done on a dana basis. But still, you know, we have uh, people are so kind and so generous that we can be, have that great privilege to be able to be supported to do that um, period of meditation, with intensive meditation. So when we're doing that, and when you have very good conditions for meditation, of course you become attached to those conditions. So this is why when, I, I, when we're doing the, uh, our range retreat this year, it's a three month retreat, and the first two weeks of that we're doing uh, like a meditation intensive, so group meditation intensive, so sitting together 12 hours a day of meditation. Okay, so that's the first two weeks. Now, well, how, how I kind of work this out, because because I I hate doing that kind of thing, right? I know I'm a monk, I'm not supposed to have preferences and so on, but I'm just being honest, all right? I hate sitting in a group with people meditating, right? And I was sort of reflecting on this, why do I, and not I hate it all the time, but why do I why do I have this aversion to it? And one one reason I had this aversion is because um, I always have better meditation when I'm by myself. That's a good reason, isn't it? Yeah. And then you're meditating, and the guy next to you is sniffing, and then somebody on the other side of the room is shuffling around, and so on and so forth. And then you're just starting to get some good meditation, and then they go ding, they ring the bell, and you've got to get up and do some chanting. And all of these kinds of things. So I sort of, in my early years as a monk, we did quite a lot of this, and I got a kind of an aversion to having group meditation. So I said, well, why don't we have like a, an annoyance and frustration retreat? Okay. So instead of having two weeks trying to get peaceful, blissful meditation, we'll just spend two weeks dealing with annoyance and frustration and aversion. Yeah. And we don't even worry whether you have any good meditation or not. Right? So if 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 you know, if Mr. Samadhi comes knocking at the door and says, "Hi, here's some peace of mind," you say, "All right, you come in." But if he doesn't, oh well, never mind. So we're just going to sit there and learn patient endurance for two weeks, which I think is a good thing. Yeah? In the in the forest tradition uh, in northeast Thailand, patient endurance is 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 the the quality which is perhaps praised more than any other, just about. Yeah, and uh, uh, you know. When um, uh, when you ask like why do there seem to be so many more enlightened monks in the northeast of Thailand compared to the rest of Thailand, uh, and then the answer you usually get is that in the northeast of Thailand the weather's really bad. There's hardly any food. Uh, the uh, and everyone, everybody's really poor, and that's that's the reason why there's more uh, enlightened monks there. And I think there's probably something to that. So that people in that kind of environment develop this quality of just patience, of just acceptance, yeah? 
and it's quite extraordinary. You know, it's it's an it's an extraordinary reality. You know, we 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 forget how easily we become impatient with things. Yeah, you get stuck in the traffic just for a few minutes, or you, you know, your 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 email site takes long takes five seconds longer to load than it should do. You know, or something, and you're starting to get annoyed already. And you see, people in that culture will will just just go on forever. I mean, honestly, they have this capacity to to do nothing. For, for just hours at a time, which is just, I think for people from a Western background or from an urban background maybe, it's just inconceivable, literally to do nothing. When you go to the, some of the monasteries, you can see the monks and they just sit there and literally don't do anything for hours on end, you know? How can you not do anything? If you give me a book to read or give me some, <laughs> you know, or do something with my hands, you know, or talk to somebody or whatever, or at least do meditation, I'm gonna do meditation. But just this capacity to literally do nothing. And to be just be very patient, very happy with that, very content. So this is, I think, some of the qualities which I'd like to develop in this this two week uh, meditation retreat. It's not just not to try, because we we get very attached to things and then we have expectations about them, and we want them to be this way. We don't want them to be that way, and of course that just causes nothing but frustration and and uh, uh, and anguish within ourselves. This is the essence of, of all the Buddhist practices, is the practice of letting go. Yeah? Just the practice of letting go. So when, <coughs> one time, when they came to ask Ajahn Chah, what kind of meditation does he teach? Does he teach tranquility meditation? Samatha, he said no. He said, do you teach insight? Vipassana, he said no. He said, well, what do you teach? He said, I teach torture. <laughs> You know, by torture, what he meant is, of course, torturing the defilements. Yeah, so not torturing people, but torturing the defilements. So sometimes you have to kind of call the bluff, and uh, but not not to, not not to do it too much. Yeah, if you do it all the time, then it becomes a grind. Yeah, if you're just doing it all the time, it becomes a grind, and that's when it becomes wearying and depressing. And, and and so this is why you need to vary it up a little bit. So this is why we're only doing like a two-week period like that. Yeah? And two weeks actually isn't all that long. And and if you do it like that, also you do it in a playful... I want to do it in like a playful way. So you do it like it's a game as well. Yeah. So you just do it... You're not, you're not sure you have this kind of grim face, you know? I went to this retreat centre in Malaysia one time. And they built this very nice new retreat centre. Or Bodhi Rama outside of Kale. It's all done very nicely in the jungle there, and so on and so forth. And then uh, it had rules for me- it had the sign on the board: rules for meditators. Rule number one: meditate seriously. I said, "Well, that's the end. <laughs> They're finished. No one's going to have any good meditation at that place. Yeah, meditate seriously. You might as well give up and go home. Yeah. Rule number one: meditate playfully. Yeah. Rule number one: meditate playfully. So if you can't, if you can't, uh, uh, if you can't enjoy when yourself when you're meditating, yeah, we have. I think we have. We still have this kind of very subtle underlying wish to torture ourselves, yeah, to actually to, 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 to torment ourselves. Back in Buddhism, they call self mortification. And uh, I think we have a subtle kind of expectation that spiritual practice is about actually hurting ourselves, yeah. Now. What does this have to do with? Does it have to be do with, with us who were brought up in a Christian culture where you have an icon of a man with, with stakes through his limbs yeah, and bleeding? And this is what you worship in terms of a spiritual icon. Yeah? I mean, that creates a very strong um, impression in the mind. Yeah? Spiritual practice is about pain. Right? So maybe that has some influence. But we still we have this idea that spiritual practice is about pain, meditation is about pain, and it's extraordinary how much, when you listen to modern meditators talking about the practice, how much they talk about pain, and when you read the Buddhist scriptures, how little they talk about it. Yeah? And so very often, you know, you hear me- modern meditation teachers telling you that pain is your friend, uh, endure through the pain, 
uh, when it hurts a lot in your meditation, don't, don't shift your posture, all of these kinds of things. Uh, learn to see through the pain, sit, you know, sit, no matter how much it hurts, just sit through it and so on. All the advice that I got when I was starting meditation, you don't find any of these things in the Buddhist scriptures. Right? None of these things. It never says pain is your friend. It never says pain is your teacher. It never says you can't shift posture during your meditation because it hurts. Yeah? None of these things. All of these things are inventions by modern meditation teachers, not found in any authentic Buddhist scriptures. Which is not to say that they're not true, okay? So I'm not saying that they're therefore not true or that they're wrong. But what I am saying is that there's an important shift in the way that we're seeing the meditation experience and the way that we're describing it and in what kind of thing we're trying, we're trying to expect from it, trying to get out from it. The Buddha talked about in meditation was the experience of tranquility, the experience of happiness, the experience of peace. These are the things that we find mentioned again and again and again and again and again. And so... Our, uh, the attitude we bring to meditation should be that attitude. It should be a blissful experience. And as uh, Ajahn Brahm mentioned in his talk the other day at the Sunday Monastery, and as uh, uh, Sunday Tito mentioned in his guided meditation, just to be comfortable when you meditate, yeah. to be to be at ease, to and and to be kind to yourself and kind to your body. If you try to force yourself into a particular posture then you're being cruel to your own body. And if you start out your meditation by being cruel to yourself, how do you think the meditation is going to go? So this is something I've always noticed. You always, you know, and I've noticed in my own meditation is this, this, this kind of, uh, like almost like a war between, you know, when you sit in meditation, you actually become very sensitive to your posture and to any kind of, you know, little kind of adjustments and so on that you want to make to your posture and so you be, you know you want your spine to be straight and you want all of these things and so you always keep wanting to to nudge it and, and so there's one part of your mind which always wants to to fiddle with things yeah to fix things and then there's another part of your mind which just wants to let go and be be relaxed about it yeah and as long as those two and I, I can see that in my mind that there's two forces working and as long as those two forces are there in conflict then your mind will never become peaceful. Yeah? But when those things are resolved and when the mind does become peaceful, then you don't worry about it anymore. Yeah? Actually, your body has wisdom. Yeah? <laughs> you go around your whole day, walking, sitting, standing, running around, all the things you have to do, and you don't have to be constantly you know, telling your body exactly how to be and adjusting it and so on. Your body has the wisdom. You learn how to sit when you're a little child, you learn how to walk, all of these things. So your body has that wisdom. If you want to train your body to refine it, that's fine. Do some yoga, do some tai chi. That's the place where you can refine that sense of body awareness and posture and so on. The meditation cushion is not that place. The meditation cushion is a place for finding, finding peace of mind. And so, uh, whatever kind of posture you choose, choose one that's comfortable and uh, that's kind for yourself. Neither too relaxed and lazy, nor too kind of erect and too tight. Either one of those will uh, cause problems. So, when we uh, come to do the, the meditation, see one of the interesting things is that there's, there's these different kinds of um, like dimensions that are going on in the meditation practice at the same time. One dimension of that is just the immediate experience. Right? Meditate, be in the present moment, watch your breath come in and out. And there's just that uh, tangible experience of the breath flowing in, the breath flowing out. It's like a sort of a cutting edge of experience. It's very immediate, it's very precise, and you're just there. Right? And that's what you're watching. So your attention is focused on that, that cutting edge, that bleeding edge of experience. Yeah? But there are other aspects of the mind which are at work as well. Okay? And those other aspects of the mind are more um, complex, more uh, long-term, and they are the aspects of the mind which are imbued or, or conditioned by your views, by your beliefs, by your motivations, by your character, by your karma, by your memories, by your experiences. All of these things, they don't cease just because you're watching the breath in that present moment. Okay? But they're working in a way behind the scenes. Right? They're working in a way which is subliminal, and so you're not seeing them, you're not noticing them. 
Now, by meditating and by being aware of the present moment, you're not adding to those things. Okay, so you're not making your mind more complex. Right, you're not uh, tightening things up anymore. Right, you're moving towards letting go, moving towards simplicity. But it doesn't mean that those things stop. They're still there and they still inform that present moment experience. So that means, and you know, we know that that's obvious. You can you go with someone and you have an argument with someone, right? Just before you meditate, you come and you sit and you meditate, and you can watch your breath coming in and out, but you still feel like crap, yeah, because of the argument you had beforehand. Even though you may be in the present moment watching that breath, you still feel bad. Yeah? Now, if you keep watching the breath and you're able to do that, then that gra gradually that bad feeling will go away. Yeah? But it doesn't go away immediately. So there's this long-term aspect to the mind as well as that immediate aspect on the present moment. So that long-term aspect is also very important because that's to do with, for example, what's, what's the motivations that's bringing you into meditation? Do you have a pure motivation? Yeah? What's the, um, what, ex what do you expect to get out of it? Yeah? So how much hopes are you investing in the meditation? How much... Uh, how much how attached are you to the outcome of it? Are you going to say, I'm going to sit here until I get jhanas or until I get uh, vipassana insights or until I get uh, enlightened or whatever? Yeah? Or I'm just going to sit here and I'm going to endure until three o'clock and then I can get up and stretch my legs or whatever you're thinking. See, this is motivation that's coming in that also informs the character of the meditation. So this also needs to be very carefully considered and very carefully looked at to reflect on oneself. What am I doing this for? Yeah? Am I just sitting here because everybody else is? Because I feel like it should be a good thing to do? Do I understand what I'm doing? Do I, can, can I reflect on my experience and see how the meditation actually works? So these are the things which all kind of go on around that immediate meditation experience. So they're, they're both part of it. Okay. So we need to reflect on both of those things. And as long as we, again come back to that original thing that I mentioned before, as long as we see these things as kind of uh, separate and, and, conf and in conflict, then to that degree our minds are not integrated. Yeah? And so again, just, just to, to reflect within ourselves that to see that immediate experience as not something which is separate from, say, daily life practice, or it's not something separate from your long-term spiritual aspirations or all of those things. But that's how that uh, appears or manifests at that moment, in this moment when you're meditating. At this moment, this is the right thing for me to be doing in terms of my overall spiritual development. It's the right thing for me to be doing at this time of the day. It's the right thing to me to, for me to be doing in terms of the community, the people who I live with. It's the right thing for me to be doing in terms of how to be kind to myself. Yeah? All of these things come together. So this is... I think, in a way, almost like what defines spiritual development as such is not the degree to which we can do any one of these things, yeah? but the degree to which we, all of those things are integrated or they're seen as being in harmony and being in balance. Yeah? And so this, as a meditation teacher and as a Dhamma teacher, you know, constantly hear these uh, questions it worries people worry about these things all the time how do I balance the meditation how do I fit that in with my daily life yeah how do I uh, integrate my retreat experience when I come back to work after my retreat yeah and how so this is constantly people are concerned about these things yeah so the, uh, that to me this is what that's saying to me oh okay so this this is what needs to be done is that learning how to integrate those things and when we can do that uh, we don't worry about it Okay, so you don't hear the Buddha worrying about those things, yeah. So he didn't sit there and he would go off on retreat, right? But he didn't sit around before the retreat worrying about it. He didn't sit around before the retreat thinking, "Oh, when am I going to be able to do my retreat? Uh, I'm only going to get two weeks to do my retreat this year. Last year I had three weeks, you know, blah blah blah. God, if only these monks could get it together and run the monastery properly, I'd be able to have a decent retreat. I uh, hope uh, no one goes crazy this year." and so on and uh, then he goes off on retreat and then when he's sitting in retreat he doesn't sort of sit there thinking oh well it's the start of my retreat I'll have to endure a lot of pain now but then I'll have some good meditation and then it'll be over yeah, in two weeks and then he finishes the retreat and then he gets excited to go back and talk to people again 
And then you talk to people and you realise that's pretty boring, actually. <laughs> <laughs> you go, oh, I wish I was back on retreat again. So this is that kind of cycle. So the Buddha's not like that, yeah? And then sometimes, you know, it's interesting, his, his, the openness of his attitude. There's one time where he was staying in a monastery in Kosambi, and this is a very famous uh, incident in the Buddhist history. A quarrel at Kosambi. And uh, what happened was that you had uh, a certain senior monk, a teacher, uh, left some water in the water dipper in the bathroom. Right? It's pretty serious, I know. Yeah. And then the uh, the vineyard master then comes along and says, "Oh, that's an offence. You can't do that. Right." can't leave water sitting stagnant in the water dipper. The reason being that because in, in ancient India then the mosquitoes would, or in India, in tropical countries anywhere, the mosquitoes would lay their larvae in the water dipper if you leave out the open water standing there. And so then you, you have to dispose, you can't kill the larvae. So it becomes a hassle. You have to find a pond. So this is what happens. If this does happen, then we have to wander around and find a pond or some kind of pool of water and pour the water in there so we don't kill the poor mosquito larvae. So the the Dhamma master left the water in the water dipper. The Vinaya master comes along and says, that's against the Vinaya, you can't do that. The Dhamma master says, no, it's not. There's no rule that says you can't do that. And he says, yes, there is. And so then the group, the students of those monks also started arguing. And uh, the Buddha heard about it and he went to the monks and he said, okay, monks, stop arguing. <laughs> so he says, this is not... And what I love about this story is how realistic it is. Yeah? It's exactly the kind of thing which monks like to argue about. Yeah? And uh, you know, it wouldn't have been a dis- dispute on the you know, nature of emptiness or you know, what's the real nature of Nibbana or something like that. Be about who can leave the water in the water river. Anyway, the student's arguing and, and the Buddha says, OK, calm down, monks, stop arguing. And then the monk said to the Buddha, don't we worry about it, you won't be responsible. We'll, we'll keep on arguing and you can just have a nice time. Right? We'll be responsible for the argument. The Buddha says, these guys are bloody hopeless. And then he just walk, walked out of the monastery. He didn't use those exact words. <laughs> <laughs> At least not in, the, not in the text as we have down, come down to it. And he wandered out of the monastery and went into the forest. And this became a very, uh, very famous episode in the Parileya forest. And he just went into retreat and gave these beautiful verses uh, which... Uh, say that, that, uh, you know, that how good it is to have good companions, good spiritual companions. That's one of the most wonderful things that you can have is great companions to help support you in the spiritual life. But if you can't find those good companions, then you should be happy to live alone. Yeah? And then just wander by yourself and find peace in, in, in nature. So it's a beautiful attitude and openness that the Buddha had to these things. Yeah? He's living in the community. There's a problem, there's a dispute. He does what he can to help. He can't solve it. The Buddha couldn't solve it. Right? The monks are arguing. Buddhist monks, right? The Buddha's there. He tries to solve it. He can't solve it. What does he say? What does he waste his time trying to solve the unsolvable? Trying to cure the incurable? Yeah? And he says, okay, I'll tell what I can. I'm out of here. Yeah? It's their karma. They're the ones disputing. Yeah, it's not his. So he goes off into the forest and he says, well, having great companions is terrific. To be able to live in a harmonious sangha is a beautiful thing. If I can't live in a harmonious sangha, I'll go and live by myself. So again, this is how, that's a, you know, that, that freedom and that, that openness that the Buddha has. So he went into the forest and stayed there and according to the legends, he was waited on by an elephant and a monkey. So if you see the um, pictures of that, sometimes you'll see the pictures or the images in uh, the Buddhist temples and so on, and there'll be the Buddha with a, an elephant and a monkey offering him dana, offering him the food. And so that's where that story comes from. And uh, I don't know, but I haven't heard of elephants, but there certainly was a monastery in Thailand where the abbot did actually train a monkey to be able to offer the, uh, the food. So <laughs> it is possible. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and the Buddha stayed there for a while, later went, moved on. And then after a while, the, uh, the quarrelling monks came to their senses and they came to see the Buddha and then they asked for forgiveness and everything was reconciled. So it sort of ended up okay in the end. So this is that, that kind of attitude, that kind of, uh, 
that, that kind of letting go attitude. It's not an attitude of irresponsibility. Right? So the Buddha wasn't trying to avoid the problem when the problem came up. He didn't say, it's not my problem, I'm not going to do anything to deal with it. Right? Uh, he tried to deal with it. Yeah? Try to deal with the problem first, but also recognize that you can't fix every problem. And that's that attitude of letting go. Yeah? So it's not an attitude of complete indifference. Yeah? And nor is it an attitude of, of like a, you know, trying to micromanage everything and fix every problem. Yeah? But just to make a reasonable what you can do, and then to have that wisdom to know what you can't do. Yeah? So the energy and compassion to do what you, you can do, and the wisdom to know that's all I can, that's all I can do. So that's the wisdom of the Buddha. So this is uh, uh, just some, some reflections about uh, uh, the approach we take and what we're going to be doing during the uh, upcoming Rains Retreat. So hopefully there'll be a lot of uh, letting go and a lot of wisdom that we can all learn during this period. And uh, we can all teach each other uh, about how to let go of various things. Um, and I just wanted to share some of those things with you this evening just to give you a bit of an idea of what we're going to be doing when we go away for the three months and hopefully maybe give a few things that might be useful maybe some things you can use or apply in your daily life <laughs> so I offer that for your reflection and I'd like to invite anyone to have any comments or questions